And uh, welcome once again, if you're, you're new with us, my name is Pastor Justin, I'm the pastor here at Grace Hill. It's wonderful to have you with us here this morning. Um, we continue our sermon series. Uh, we are in the book of Revelation. We are working right through the book of Revelation. And at the beginning of the book, uh, Jesus has a message for seven different churches. And we are on the seventh church today. And we are looking at the church of Laodicea. Um, and so we, we had this map at the beginning to kind of point this out. But John, uh, the apostle John is writing this. He was boiled alive and did not die. And so they didn't know what to do with him. And so they sent him in exile to the island of Patmos, circled there in blue. Um, and he is writing a letter because Jesus has appeared to him. Um, legend has that uh, it, there's a mountain cave, and that's where Jesus appeared to him. And he wrote all this down. And he is sending uh, this letter out to the seven churches in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. And today is the seventh church, Laodicea. Um, and then... Once we're done with this week, we get into, uh, if you've never read the book of Revelation before, you get to, um, and it gets, it gets very interesting from here on out. And so you actually have homework. I want you to write this down or make a little note in your phone, um, whatever you need to do, but I need you to read chapter four through all the way chapter 8 verse 6 so 4 1 through 8 6 for next week because I'm not going to have time to to really go kind of line by line through this and explain it we're going to have to go in big chunks and it would be really helpful once you read it you'll understand why I'm having you do this it'll be really helpful if you've already read it so that we can kind of talk big picture so Revelation chapter 4 1 through Revelation chapter 8 verse 6 is what we're going to cover next week and so Saturday or on your way to church next week when it, for you procrastinators, procrastinators there, um, you can read it then, but otherwise you can read it throughout the week and catch up um, so that you're ready for next week. But this is our, our last message here to the churches. And today, this is what Brady just read to us, um, but this is what Jesus has to say. Um, I, I like when I read my Bible and I realize that Jesus is just like me. Um, you see, uh, my wife loves me very much. Um, she just thinks the world of me. Um, and it probably shocks you, but there's like only one or two things I do that annoy her on a frequent basis. Um, and one of them is that I am militant in our house about the temperatures of food. Like, militant. Um, and, and it's just, I, I can't, you know, like my wife, she will like be making mac and cheese for the kids, you know, and so she'll pull out the milk and leave it on the counter. And, and then she like, you know, pours it into the mac and cheese and leaves it on the counter. And then she pours out the kids' little cups, you know, and leaves it on the counter. And, and then like she leaves it out there just in case she needs to refill it or something. And if I'm around... She spends the whole time going, where's the milk? And I've put it back in the fridge because that's where it goes. It's cold, it needs to stay in the fridge. You know, if there's butter out, I put it back in the fridge. She literally, because I don't know what she makes, but she'll have to leave cream cheese out and she'll have to come and tell me multiple times, like, leave that out, that stays. Because I'm just like, no, 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 that's supposed to be in the fridge. Um, I'm militant about it. Like, if there's a food or drink that is supposed to be hot, it needs to be hot. And if it is supposed to be cold, it needs to be cold. I cannot stand when temperatures are messed up. And so like I read this and I'm like, Jesus, you get me. I love you. Um, I will spew that lukewarm stuff out of my mouth. Um, but this is an important phrase. This is an important verse. Jesus actually has a very, very relevant message for us in this today. Because what Jesus is talking about um, it, it is that same kind of disgust. This is, this is not what it's supposed to be. It needs to be what it's supposed to be. And so he says, you know, I, I wish, Laodicea, I wish that you were either hot, which, which we understand is, you know, burning on fire for Jesus, you know, just like alive for Jesus, like all in, or I wish that you were cold. And what he doesn't mean is like a cold heart to Jesus, like, like anti-Jesus, hate Jesus. What he means is doesn't know Jesus, like ha has no knowledge of Jesus. And, and he says, I wish that you were either hot or cold because the people that know Jesus and just do nothing with him are complacent about Jesus or apathetic with Jesus. He, he's like, you guys, they, you are just such a challenge. And, and this is true. We know that it's, you know, it's harder to boil warm water than, than cold water. You know, like there's just something about, he says, you know, when you are cold, when you have no knowledge of Jesus, man, that gospel comes and it just warms you right up. You know, like you're, you're hot, you're excited and you're all in. 
But to that person that's just kind of warm, and they know, they know about Jesus. They're not going to hear anything, but they're, they're not on fire, and they're not. To, he's like, that's, there's just nothing for you. There's no part of this. You're, you're a Christian in name only. And, and we don't have to raise hands in here, but how many of us, hopefully not us personally, but probably some of us here, or we know somebody that, that's Christian in name only. They will tell everyone they know, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian, yet they, they don't go to church. They don't use words that reflect their faith. They don't act like they reflect their faith. In the workplace, you, you they talk like a sailor and, and, and you know, they, they don't do this that models the faith. Like, we know these people. And he says, look, Laodicea, you're just a church of this. You're a church that is in name only Christian, but there's nothing in you that's on fire. There's nothing in you that really reflects what I am and what I'm about. And so then he, he continues on, and, and he kind of points the, the root problem to this. He says, you say I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. This is what the people of Laodicea say. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I bet that went well when they read that letter out. You know, like, you know, excitement, like, hey, Jesus has a letter for us, guys. Let's read this. You are pitiful and poor and blind and naked. Yay, Jesus. Okay, um, I, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Now, what's interesting about this is, is Jesus points out something about them that, that I think a lot of times we think people 2,000 years ago were very different. We're much more evolved now. We're much more smart. Uh, but all these things. But what we see here is that people in America today in 2021 are the same as people back in Laodicea 2,000 years ago in 98 AD uh, is about when this was written because they are putting false confidence in created things. They felt protected by their wealth. It is very hard for people with material comforts to believe that God is not happy with them, right? How many of you, if, if you've got a good paying job and if things are going well and all your bills are covered and everything's going on, you believe God is happy with you. But the second you lose your job or the second you get demoted or the second that the, the bills add up or all of a sudden there's something that, you know, the car breaks and you gotta pay, then you're like, oh, God hates me. We do play this game with God as well where somehow financially, if everything's okay, God must be happy with us. But if it's not, then he's angry. And yet God goes, I, I don't work like that. You work like that. God says, look, your physical comfort, it blunts the spiritual discomfort needed in repentance. You don't recognize how wretched and pitiful and naked you are because you're comfortable financially. And the people of Laodicea were very wealthy. They were very wealthy. And God said, look, you, you don't recognize how wretched and pitiful you are. Um, we, we, uh, last Sunday, um, we went down and built beds. Uh, there was a group from, from church here that went down and built beds for kids right here in our city that don't have beds. And I was talking with uh, Mark Kicker, one of our, our, our uh, members here. And uh, he, he was talking about it. And he said, you know, it, it's just something like, you walk into their house and these little kids light up and they say, are you here with our beds? And, and he goes, yeah, you know, you go in and you build a bed and they're jumping in it and they're laying in it and you make it for them for the first time and they're covered up in it and, and they're not sleeping on a floor and then you drive back to your West Omaha house and you look at that and you just go, you know what? I can trick myself into believing I'm doing okay and it's all because of money and comfort and the truth is, they were just as happy with that and, and we're both struggling in our own ways. And it's true. I, when I've been on mission trips, those kids down there in the Dominican Republic, they were filled with joy. And here I was, a high school kid, bored out of my mind and, and thinking my life is wretched in America with all these blessings that they can't even dream of. We can convince ourselves that if we have money, we're okay. And, and Jesus says, look, this is what you've been doing. And he mocks them. You see, the, the, the city of Laodicea, you know what they were really wealthy in? They had a, a gold mint, 
where they, they made gold. And so he's saying, look, if, I mean, look at the, the words that Jesus chooses. Um, look, I counsel you to buy from me the gold refined in the fire. Um, so he's, he's saying, you guys make these gold mints and you think that's all great, but there are impurities in your gold. The gold that I have to offer you, the, the richness of heaven, there are no impurities in that. And then they, they were also known for their very expensive clothing that people came to buy. And one of the most expensive was white because in that day and age, to wear white, you had to be really wealthy because they didn't have washing machines. You know, like that stuff gets dirty quick. Um, and, and so you, only rich people really wore a lot of white because they had to have a lot of it. And he's saying, look, you, you, wanna, you wanna wear white, Jesus says? I can offer you forgiveness and you can put on the righteous robe of white that I will give you. And there will need be no need to, to wash it and cleanse it. It will be uh, blameless and, and, and there will be no shame in it. He says, I can give you that. And then he says, um, your, your salve. And so in this city, in Laodicea, they would manufacture this, this healing salve that people would come from all over to, to put on this ointment that they believed healed them. And he says, look, I can give you the salve for your eyes so that you, your spiritual blindness can go away. I can make you see. And so Jesus has a direct message to them here saying, look, you're, 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 living this facade thinking that because everything's going well for you and you're wealthy that everything's okay with you spiritually and he says it's not you're broken you're pitiful you're naked you're blind you need to wake up and so then he he continues on and he says this in verse 19 those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and eat with that person and they with me. And so what he's saying is like, look, I love you and that's why I'm trying to wake you up. I love you and that's why I'm holding you accountable because you think you're fine. You're telling everyone you're a believer, but you are not believers. You are lukewarm. You are just comfortable people that, that are not following me whatsoever. And he says, out of love, I'm gonna rebuke you so that you will hear my voice, you will repent. And once you repent, w once you understand that you do need to repent, well, then we can have a relationship. Then we can eat together. Then we can be family together. And then he closes with this promise in verse 21. To the one who is victorious, that is the one that follows through and, and is able to repent, um, I will give the right to sit on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so what he means by that is, is the throne is a place of reward. And he's saying, you get my inheritance. You get what I have. I get to give you my reward that I have, and I get to give it to you. So let's step back and look at the big picture. The big picture is this. The church of Laodicea was Christian in name only. Jesus has nothing nice to say about it. He, in some of the other churches, he said, well, at least there's a remnant of you, or at least some of you follow. To this church, he has nothing kind to say. He simply says, you guys are so comfortable that you think you're fine and you're not. Now, step back and look at the big picture of that. So often we get angry with God when he puts something of a roadblock in our path. But so many of us are guilty of this, that we are comfortable all the time. And in order to wake us up and get our attention, God has to do what? Put a roadblock in our path. What do these people need? They, Jesus is saying, your wealth is blocking you from seeing your true spiritual needs. What they need is some type of economic problem to wake up and say, you know what? Life isn't about all this. I need more. I'm not okay. I'm not doing it. And so often in life, when we, when we read the Bible and it says things like, God, I, I, I celebrate your rebuke. God, I celebrate your discipline. That's what David is talking about. And we read that and go, why would anyone do that? And that's exactly what God's saying. You need to wake up. And if you won't wake up on your own, I will put things in your life to wake you up. And it's out of love. But we don't like that message. We're just like, hey, God, just let me, let me keep doing what I'm doing that's really comfortable, and, and, and I'll come around. I'll, I'll figure this out. And God goes, no, it's getting too late. I'm going to put stuff in your life to wake you up. I'm going to make things not comfortable for you because then I'll have your attention. And how many of you can testify that you, your prayer life is like this, and then all of a sudden someone gets diagnosed with cancer in your family, and all of a sudden your prayer life is like this? that your prayer life is like this and all of a sudden your company's in trouble and everything might go under and all of a sudden your prayer life is like this. And God goes, why do you make me do things like this to get your attention? 
Because if you would just stay connected to me when I bless you, then we're good. But you bring this on yourself that I have to wake you up and bring you back to me because when I let you be comfortable, you get comfortable with everything. And you just walk away. And so when we look at the big picture of this, this is our question. In what ways are we like the people of Laodicea? In what ways is our faith guilty of being lukewarm? And and, and so I want to ask you this question. Is your faith evident everywhere and to everyone? Would everyone that knows you, so let's back this up. If we put a camera in your house and watched you for a week, would we step back as a church and go, that's a family that believes in Jesus? Would that be evident to everyone that watches? If, if we followed you to work and the way you treat your, your fellow, uh, your boss and, and the people under you and the way you speak and act and, and would we say, yeah, that person's a Christian? What about with your friends, old friends and new friends? Would they say, oh yeah, they're a Christian? Your neighbors. Okay, let's take this another step. Would the people driving with you on the streets say that you're a Christian? Would the waiter who was 20 minutes late bringing your food out say you're a Christian? Would the referee at your kid's sports game say you're a Christian? Is your faith evident everywhere? And if you're like me, well, yeah, there's, there's areas of my life that absolutely, I'm on fire. Like, you can see the evidence. I, I, I strive to make sure people know that I'm a believer and model that. But could you find an arena or a, a compartment of my life where it might not be as evident? Sure. And I would imagine you're like me. So does that make us all lukewarm? Is that, is that what Jesus is talking about? Well, no, because Jesus takes it a step further and says the evidence of being lukewarm is repentance, a lack of repentance. Because that's what needs to be seen. Is your repentance evident everywhere and to everyone? Because everyone in this room and everyone watching, we are all going to fall short. We are all going to have areas of strength and we are all going to have areas where, where people might not know we're a Christian and we're not walking the line very well and we're not doing very well. And so what is the evidence that we are a Christian? Well, it's not being perfect, but it is being a person of repentance. It's being a person that is willing to say, you know what, I messed up right there and, and, and you should hold me to a higher uh, expectation because I'm a Christian and I'm trying to follow Jesus and, and, and I'm not perfect, but I, you need to know that, that what I did was wrong. I can tell you this. I can remember the most unbelievable apologies in my life that just floored me. I, I, I remember I was a teenager and my dad came home and, and I know none of you parents ever do this but for whatever reason he was just he was in a bad mood it was like whoo watch out for that man and, and of course that was the day that I had uh, gotten in trouble um, and so like it was like radar you know just woo, doo, 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 he's coming um, and, uh, and so um, I got a, a million dollar punishment for like a five dollar crime I mean, grounded, I'm not doing this, I'm not going here, this is done. Like, and, and, and we came to, to you know, an argument, and I'm like, you know, you're being ridiculous, and I got banished in my room and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and later that night, a little card slid under my, my door. And I opened it up, and my dad had gone to Walgreens, and he had written out a whole card to me, apologizing, and saying, you know what? A bunch of stuff happened at work. I'm really sorry. I love you. You know, like, my dad always flew off the handle. You know, like, I'm sorry. I don't want to be like that. I want to... I held on to that card for years. For years. Why? Because it meant something to me. Did he have to apologize? No. But it set a mark in our family of this is who we are. I remember I was in college, and uh, I... 
once again, I'm sure none of you know anything about this, but me and my roommates, um, we had a gathering of, of acquaintances. Um, and uh, for all our graduates that are getting ready, you know, just a, a study group, you know. Um, we're going to celebrate our, our graduates today. Um, just a study group. And, and um, it, it was a, a very lively party. And me and my, my three roommates, the next day, this girl comes back over, and she knocks on the door. And she comes in with tears in her eyes. And she said, I, I just want you guys to know, like, I'm a, I'm a Christian. And I was embarrassed. Like, you should... You shouldn't expect that of me. Like, that's not how I was raised. And I just want you guys, and we're all sitting there like, okay, first off, like, we barely know you. Like, and here you are apologizing to us, like, because you weren't a good Christian witness. And I'm sitting there like, you know, it was like a spotlight on me. It's like, well, I haven't been to church in like a year and a half. So, like, I, I felt very convicted in this moment. But I can tell you this, here it is 18 years later, and I still remember that to this day, that she had no, she had no need to come over and apologize to us. But it meant that much to her that she would make sure that she would represent Christ well and, uh, and, and apologize to four stupid college boys that she did not set a good example of who she's supposed to be. The mark of the church that is following Jesus is a church that is willing to admit its mistakes. The church that is willing as individuals to go out and say, you know what, it's not okay. How many of you know somebody that says, well, I don't go to church and I don't believe because of this person? Because someone that called themselves a Christian did this or said this or acts like this or gets on TV news and says this and this and this and, and, and because nobody gets up and apologizes and because nobody says that's not the way it's supposed to be, that's not the way I'm supposed to act, that's not the way that, that we're supposed to talk because nobody will set the record straight, these people hate the church and walk away. And Jesus says, the mark of the church will be the church that is not afraid to go up and say, I was wrong. And I, I, you should expect better of me. And I'm sorry. Why do they hate the church? Because the church acts like it's perfect. And they know it's not. So if we as Christians know that the wrath of God has already been paid out on Jesus and know that the forgiveness has already won, we just get to go out and reconcile. There's no punishment coming our way. There, there's, no, there's no retribution. We just get to go out and say, you know what? I'm embarrassed. I'm sorry. I'm a Christian and that wasn't okay. I, you know, you're just a drive through food person and yeah, you messed up my order. You know what? I was in a bad mood and I'm so sorry. Do you know what kind of a difference that would make to that person? Do you know what kind of an example that would set for that person of what a Christian is? And Jesus says, look, you're gonna mess up. But the mark of a believer, the mark of someone that is hot is someone that's willing to go out and set things right and reconcile. And that'll be the mark of the church. And so that's what I want us to get a chance to do right now. It is to go before the Lord and get reconciled. Let's get reconciled to him and then we can step out and be reconciled to others. And so bow your heads, close your eyes, and let's go before the Lord in this time of confession. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, and there isn't one of us here, watching or here in person, that is not a failure at something. We, we know the things we should say, and we know the things we shouldn't say. We know the things we should do and that we shouldn't do. We know the thoughts we have. We know the motives behind them. And Lord, every single one of us is guilty. And so, Lord, let us first be right with you. That's what you, you said in the scripture is that those who respond to your voice, that you're knocking and you're, you're calling us to repentance, that when we step into that, you receive us as family. And so, Lord, put it on our hearts and let us silently confess to you now. Lord, we could go on and on and on on the list of things that we have done that have fallen short of who we're called to be. But Lord, you love us and you forgive us. And you paid the price. You paid the punishment already 
on your son that we deserve. And so, Lord, we thank you. And we humbly ask that you would forgive us, that you would restore us and redeem us and reconcile us to you. And, Lord, we pray that you would give us the strength and the courage to go and be reconciled to others. It is in the name of your son, Jesus, who paid on the cross with his own body and blood the price of our sin. It is in his name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. I want to take a moment and go first. I am not a perfect person. I'm not a perfect pastor. I am sure that there have been times that I have said or done something that might have offended somebody. I'm sure there are times that I said I will call you or email you, and I did not. I apologize. You are not insignificant. I love you. I just forgot. If there is ever anything I have done that has offended you, please come talk to me. And I guarantee we are not going to have an argument over who is right or wrong. I guarantee the first words out of my mouth will be, I'm so sorry. I never meant to hurt you. And if this church has ever done anything, if we've made decisions that, that hurt your feelings, or come and talk to me. We, that's not what we do here. We're not above saying, I'm sorry. And so from Grace Hill, if we've ever done anything, if there's ever been something that's happened, we're sorry. We love you and we're sorry. And I pray that every single one of you have somebody on your heart right now that you know, you know without a doubt the second you walk out this room that you should call them and say, you know what, it was five years ago, but I messed up and I just, it's eating at me. I gotta let you know that that's not what you should expect from me, that you deserved better. And I don't want you to talk yourself out of it and I don't want you to chicken out, and I don't want you to say, well, no. if it's your boss and they got on you this week because you, you forgot something and so you lashed out, go back and apologize. I messed up. If it's your spouse and, and you know you messed up, man, you gotta live with that person. Go make it right. Today, on the way home, they know you need to apologize. You don't think that's gonna be a weird ride home? Them just looking at you the whole time going, are you gonna do it or not? Do it. If you're a parent, don't think you're too above apologizing to your kids. They know you mess up. They know you're a failure. They love you. Apologize to your kid. Apologize to you. Go be reconciled. And if it's a big thing, a, a, a mom or a brother or a cousin that you haven't talked to in years, go be reconciled. That's the mark of a Christian. Our, our sin is already paid for. Our wrath and punishment is already done. We just get to go and do the fun thing. Go and be reconciled and restore that relationship. Go do it today. Because you are loved and you are forgiven and you are reconciled. In the name of your Lord Jesus, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.